Hello, hello, everyone. We are live. And bear with me one second, just wanting to edit Facebook. Let's see. Edit post. Now it's public. Perfect. And we are now public. Yes, we are. <laughs> awesome. Thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, this is The Journey Within, yes, the are. journey of deconstruction and reconstruction of a death and rebirth. Uh, and today I am very thrilled to have Ellen Teresa joining us. Just a very loving soul. And we were just having, we and very funny too. You're just I love it. I love the jokes. I almost wish we had recorded that, you know? But... I know. It would have been good. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for having this conversation. Sure thing. Uh, maybe we just start off like uh, just a little introduction, like who you are, what you do, and, and go from there. Okay. Um, well, I am a spiritual coach. I probably have been doing that for the last 35 years, um, just like doing a lot of different spiritual counseling on different levels. Um, but I've now kind of turned it into a business. It's new, but it's moving into the stages where, you know, clients are come, you know, people can come and they can, you know, take up my services. Um, I'm also a intuitive guidance person. Anytime people want intuitive guidance, I check in and, and help them, you know, learn how to receive from the other dimensions that are out there and what they can find for themselves. I'm also a healer. I would call myself probably a faith healer. Um, mm. I do Reiki and uh, help shift the energy over people's lives. And it's uh, really powerful to see what can happen with people in that. Um, and then I'm a mentor. I've always been a mentor for young people. I just have a thing for millennials and teenagers. And, you know, and so I do that as well. Well, I'm a millennial. So yeah, you are <laughs> generation. <laughs> now, I have to ask about with with faith healing. I'm just curious. Um does Reiki operate on the same principles as faith healing? You know, I, I personally would say that it does. I guess if you're looking at faith healing from a, a Christian standpoint, it might be seen a little bit differently. But for me, it's tapping into the energy that is there. And I am just shifting the energy over people's bodies like I did for years with laying on of hands with people in Christianity, which I didn't even know I was actually doing that. But that was what I was doing. I was actually moving things that were blocking them, that were in the way, whether it be over their mind, all of that. And so I just, I tap into it. I tap into the energy in my hands, just like I did when I practiced charismatic Christianity and I lay hands. Wow. And sometimes and I don't lay hands. Sometimes it's just going over people's bodies. But I, I have seen people be healed that way and different things, blockages removed. Yeah. It's really interesting. Is that, did you grow up in charismatic Christianity? No, I, I was raised in a Lutheran household. So oh. um, yeah, I was confirmed Lutheran. I went to church every Sunday, learned, you know, the scriptures, but it was a denominational church. And so we didn't see any of the movings of the spirit like you would see in a charismatic church visibly, even though my mom was having encounters with God next to me in the pew. I personally wasn't, though. I was very disconnected from what was happening within the church itself. I couldn't have found God in that place for me if I if I had really? tried. Yeah, I just I I never connected. I've heard that with with the Lutheran Church, it's not so Bible centered as it is like more like tradition. Is that is that an accurate representation? Um, it depends on what branch of the Lutheran Church you're going into. Okay. My parents practiced the Missouri Synod Lutheran, and that is very Bible believing, extremely conservative, and very much traditional. Got it. Okay. So, how did you go from couldn't find God in that church to oh, yes. now I'm laying on hands and seeing I, well, I, 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 How did that all happen? Well, you know, I think like my life was pretty tumultuous growing up. And so, I think that was a lot of the reasons why I had trouble connecting um, in different areas with Source. But basically what ended up happening to me was I was rescued out of a very terrible situation um, and I was being abused and I was rescued by a pastor. And that pastor 
was a charismatic pastor. And I had never learned anything about the charismatic movement. I didn't know anything about speaking in tongues or healings or anything. I read about stuff in the Bible, but I had never experienced it. And when he rescued me out of this situation I found myself in, well, then I ended up having an encounter at that time with what I would call was Jesus. And that was my first like spiritual experience with Christianity. Now, growing up, I had other experiences. I saw angels when I was um, a little girl. I also saw um, very dark presences that would be in my room as there was just so much chaos going in the house. So there was a lot of dark energy that was present. But I did have an encounter um, with what I would say was Jesus at the age of 21. Wow. So you've always been very like intuitive and spiritually attuned. Totally. totally. Yeah. I think I came out of the womb that way. <laughs> That's what I tell people. That's interesting. So do you actually like see these things? Like it's like a, like a vision or, or something? Um, it Sometimes it can be in the form of a vision. Sometimes it can be in just in the form of a picture in front of me. And other times it's a total live interaction where I see angels walking and moving um, around. There are angels here right now. Really? Yes, we're talking. Yes. Now I'm just like, yeah, okay. Know, this is this is very interesting. Interesting. <laughs> and so when when you were seeing these things, um, did you realize that like other people, like this is not like a normal experience for other people? Or did you how, how was that? I actually thought it was normal. I thought other people were seeing it, but not saying anything because I didn't say anything either. I mean, I didn't walk around and say, hey, I see angels standing next to you, you no, know, or or I'm seeing like um, I would see different things in the woods. I would see like fairies. I would see a lot of the elementals that, that people talk about that are, that are in the woods. I'd see tree spirits. I would see animal spirits. I saw all sorts of things when I was little growing up. But at the same time, that was also explained to me in the house that anything related to um, other things outside of Christianity was not accepted. So I then started oh, wow. to almost shut that down inside myself. Did that actually cut off the, the the intuition and the vision, or it lessened it? Lessened. It never went away. No, it, it never went away. Got it. So once you were like you had this encounter of uh, twenty one with Jesus. Yes. What what happened after that? Like, were you starting to like read the Bible and like be this on fire Pentecostal? Like, what? What was what was going on? Oh, yes, I was the holy roller, Jesus, Bible thumper. Yes, that was me. Oh. And and it was because I had a real encounter. Like there was something that happened to me minus religion. See, religion and I have issues, but Jesus and I, we don't have the issues. And so I had this real experience and then I was immediately whisked into church. And my experience then was explained to me what this was. And it was amazing how it kind of started to get dumbed down a bit in the way that they were explaining it. And I was like, no, that's not what I, I, this was really deep and personal. I felt a penetrating love. I felt arms around me, hug me, you know, and they were like, well, you know, I mean, it was pretty interesting. So then it was immediately, we got to start on the Bible and I began to devour the Bible. I was a Bible studier. I had tons, I had the concordance out. I had, I had all different, you know, different versions of the Bible and I would just study it like no tomorrow on end. I, I think I really taught myself to read really well intellectually because of the Bible. I was just reading it so much so. And I would speak it out of my mouth. I'd take verses and go up to people randomly and say, hey, look what it says here in the Bible. Yeah, I was a total Jesus nerd. I really was. And then on the back of my um, university jacket, I had embroidered in gold letters, Jesus loves you, um, because now I was part of this Christian fellowship on the campus. And and I was really a full-on evangelist. Like I went around wow. telling people about Jesus. I mean, I, I went with the message that everybody was going to hell. Um, that, that didn't go over too well, but <laughs> <laughs> that, that wasn't happening, but I definitely, definitely shared all the time mm. and I saw amazing things happened. I, I, I would go up to people and ask if I could pray for them. I was really that 
on fire and they would get healed. Like I yeah. would lay my hands on them and their foot was made right. Their back would be healed. The torment in their mind would go away. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. And I would just feel like the fire as I would have called it back then, the fire of the Holy Spirit yeah. was right here in the palms of my hands. And it, yeah, I was just inspired. That is so crazy. Um, Which I'm just curious, like which campus ministry were you part of? I was part of what was called New Life Christian Fellowship. New Life. Okay. I haven't heard of that one. I was a part of InterVarsity, so I oh, wasn't yeah. sure if, yeah, yeah. Great group. Great group. Yeah. That is so, that is so crazy. And I know um, you were at some point associated with YWAM and you did overseas missions. Is that correct? I did. I worked for 16 years in overseas missions, but I wasn't in YWAM the entire time. But the way, you know, YWAM, I don't know how much are you familiar with YWAM? You know, like very briefly, um, I know, well, my conception was they were charismatic, mm -hmm. but I was listening to to your podcast. I can't remember the, the gentleman's name, but I guess you guys were sharing that there's a wide variety of theological diversity in that. Completely. I mean, you have all different denominations represented. It's people from all different backgrounds show up at a particular base. So it is a smorgasbord of a lot of different types of Christian um, denominations and Christianity in general. Now, the bases I chose were very charismatic because I really was a runner after signs and wonders, to be honest. And so the YWAM bases that I was all involved in talked about raising the dead, talked about laying on hands, talked about yeah. healings, talked about speaking in tongues, talked about all of the, the moving of the supernatural and healings. And, and I, I mean, we saw powerful stuff happen on the base as well. Like we would just see people be healed. People were mm -hmm. experiencing releases and freedoms from really dark energy. And I don't know if I'd call it demonic, um, like, you know, I used to, but, but people were getting released of stuff. It, it, it was real. Yeah. Would, would it be okay to share, like, was there any one experience that kind of comes to mind that sticks out for you? Yes, actually. Um, yes. So I served in Papua New Guinea. And part of the trip going to Papua New Guinea was a preparation. So you had to pray, you had to get ready for the trip. And I was leading a team of young people such as your age, the little millennials. <laughs> I was leading um, you guys into Papua New Guinea. And I remember saying before I left the base in New Zealand, because that's where I was based. And then you go out into another nation and serve and, you know, talk to people about Jesus. I said, I want just one woman who um, has either mental illness or is a witch doctor of sorts, um, you know, that is like terrorizing the neighborhood. And I just want that woman because I want to see her free and released in her mind. And so we went to Papua New Guinea. We went way up into the highlands. We were doing ministry. And one night um, a girl had shared her testimony. And then out of the blue came this woman who was like screaming and yelling at the top of her lungs. And everybody was frightened and afraid of this woman because she had just gone around to all the other villages and was inflicting them and bringing terrible, dark things to them. And I mean, she was just known as being this like powerful, scary woman. And so the whole crowd parted. I mean, it was like a biblical story. It's like the whole crowd parted this way and it's me facing this woman. And I remember standing there going, wow, God, like if you don't show up right about now, this is going to look really stupid because this woman is right here in front of me. And clearly, God, I felt like wanted to do something in this in this moment. So I started to approach the woman and the husband told me I was not allowed to touch her. The pastors were like, you weren't allowed to touch her. But I felt I had the inspiration to take these two fingers, lay hands right here on her wrist, her veins. That's where I felt I was supposed to go. So I'm like taking my two fingers. It's kind of a funny story. I'm trying to go to this woman and they're like batting my hand away. And then the husband tackled me. And then it was like this. What? I was like, I have to touch this woman. And they said, no, you can't touch this woman, you know, because they were afraid I would get hurt, all of this stuff. And I said, I am directed to touch this woman. So I stood up boldly. Something came over me. I felt the heat in my hands. And I just said, God, if you don't show up, this is going to be ridiculous because the whole crowd, like, like everybody is watching this up moment right then. And I went up to her and I got her very briefly because her arms were flailing like this. 
and I hit her right here, just right there. She flew back. I don't know, 20, 30 feet, something like that. Began flopping around. This happened for 15, 20 minutes. Um, she just, I would go touch her. She'd fly into the air, come down, fly into the air, come down. This went on forever. People thought, I mean, this is all documented too, in case people are wondering. <laughs> <laughs> so um, people thought like, like, what is going on? Like, this is absolutely crazy. Long story short, I just saw her get delivered. Like immediately she slumped down. I thought she, at first I thought she was dead and I thought, oh great. Like if we killed her, now I'm going to have to like lay hands on her to raise her from the dead. Like I, yeah. I didn't plan B in my head, right? Cause this was so radical. I was, I just believed anything was possible. And so um, she came to long story short, she was put in her right mind. All the dark stuff within her was gone. And for the next three weeks while we were ministering, she followed us from village to village to village, sharing the testimony of how she was put back in her right mind. She said she had met Jesus, um, all that stuff. She said that he touched her head. She was free. Mm -hmm. um, and believe it or not, a massive, huge revival happened in the Highlands because this woman who serviced all these villages was now the opposite. And yeah. was completely free yes this literally sounds like a story from x yeah, like this exactly what it is. <laughs> I can't believe, that's amazing yeah that is crazy so with with all of that what actually got you started on this path of deconstruction right because and that's always the big question people ask me yeah. because i've had lots of encounters with the a positive parts of god yeah. i have some encounters. Well, what ended up happening was very simple. It happened while I was on the mission field, while overseas, best place to have it happen. You're supposed to be sure of your message. And so um, I started seeing other spiritualities, other spiritual traditions, other religions heal people. See, for me, I wasn't very much into an intellectual gospel. I was very much experiential in signs and wonders. And so the perfect way for, I believe, God to deconstruct me and remove me out of religion was to use something in a way <laughs> that would catch my attention. And so signs and wonders is what he used. And I saw a Buddhist literally heal a man's foot by laying hands on him and saying some mantras. And I went, okay. I was taught that that didn't happen. Then mm -hmm. I saw when I was in India, I saw Hindus do certain things. And I was like, wait, I was taught that's not possible. What's going on here? This is a little bit, a little bit mix up message here happening. I'm, I'm not quite understanding what's going on here. And little by little by little, the whole idea of Christianity having the corner on the market for healings began to get shattered right in front of me. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, I can hear the counter argument in my head is, well, of course, they can heal by the power of demons, of Beelzebub. Oh, was yeah. that something that was, you know, how you rationalize that? Or like, was that spoken? Like, how did you kind of work through that? Well, I that was my first thought. Oh, this is this is a false spirit. This is a false right. healing. Because what had been taught to me was that when demons would heal, this was what was taught when demons would heal they would eventually corrupt the person even more and that the healings would end. That was not what I saw. I saw them get better and better and better. Huh. And I saw fullness and wholeness and everything return back to their body. And, and with my understanding of dark energy and, and forces and my understanding of light, I had to say, this is totally light. This is totally God. This is totally like, this is, this is not evil. And that's how I began to diagnose it because I kept looking for the, the, the marks of error. I was looking, you know, I was like, are they getting worse? Are the symptoms coming back? Is something going on? Never. I never hmm. saw it. And so then I was starting to weigh miracles. Then that's what was happening. Then I'm like, well, I laid hands on this woman and she became like this and you laid hands on this woman and she became like this. And I started to compare. Okay. Cause it, this is what I did. Yeah. I was like comparing the miracles to see which one was more genuine both were genuine and that made me completely question everything i had been taught around <clears throat> excuse me religions and spirituality and all of that that is interesting with i don't know if 
um, with some of the, the healings that you've experienced that the symptoms did come back. So I just want to share briefly, um, when I was on the college campus, I would, with my friend and I, we would lay hands on people and they would get better, like small things, not like cr anything crazy, but you know, their headache would go away, their sickness would go away, their back would get better or their foot would get better. But for some reason, um, you know, we'd see them like a week later and then it, it would be the same again. Like it all got better temporarily. And okay. we always wonder like, well, what's going on here? Like we mm -hmm. laid hands and, and we, we spoke in Jesus name, but it kind of came back. I don't know if you had anything like that. I did. I saw some of that. Um, and I think at the time when I would see that, I would rationalize that as well. I would I would come up with a reason they were that way with the scripted reasons I was taught. And the scripted reasons I was taught was they have sin in their life. Um, you know, they've opened the door again to the enemy to allow the enemy to come back in. Um, I see that all now totally differently because I now believe that healing is a is a process. It's pro, you know it's a progression. Hmm. And so I think there were some things that were healed immediately. But more often than not, now, at least even, I'm seeing a lot of things very progressively happen in people's lives because there's trauma attached to things. There's, you know, belief systems, all sorts of things are attached to things. What we're eating can bring back symptoms of a stomach ache. You know, what we're putting in our mind can bring back symptoms um, of, you know, a headache or difficulty in thought. Yeah. Huh. What what do you think was well actually let me let me ask you this like how long was that that process to where you started to realize oh like Christianity doesn't have the corner on the market for healing how about how long did that take twenty seven years because for twenty seven years I was convinced That's and then I went incredible. overseas and I was wrecked. Yeah. In a good way, oh, in a real yeah, yeah. way. Yeah. Wow. What, um, so once, once you deconstructed, what, what do you think was the hardest part in all of that? Well, I think the whole thing was a living hell, to be honest. <laughs> um, I think it was extremely difficult because I, really loved God with everything in me. And here I am seeing things and experiencing things that were going totally the opposite of what I had been taught. So I think for me, the whole entire stage of deconstruction was just difficult because then I would come to the understanding that things in the Bible weren't true or things in the Bible were mm -hmm. metaphors. Like I spent time in the country of Jordan and I sat with rabbis and we were, I was asking questions about different things related to the Bible and they were just knocking it down left and right. And I was like, Oh my God, like that, that doesn't even, that doesn't pertain to me. So I think it was a lot of the ahas, like, Oh my God, I've been misusing the Bible all these years. Wow. claiming things in the Old Testament that weren't even for me and written to a whole totally different culture and time. So that was extremely difficult for me. But then it forced me to have to look at my own, my own life. And I had to start to piece together like, okay, I use this scripture in my life, but that wasn't for me. What happened to me then when I, when I, took that scripture and used that scripture. And I started to realize over time that there was a lot of emotionalism and a lot of um, almost, I, I forget what that's called. The, I know the second word is the effect. What is it? Where people believe something long enough and, and eventually overtakes them. And that's what happened. I, I was believing something so long, but then when it got upended, it just took so much time for me to undo it. Yeah. And that was really hard. I mean, it was really hard. I felt betrayed. I felt betrayed by the church. Um, wow. I felt betrayed by leaders. I felt betrayed by God. I was like, why couldn't you, why couldn't you show me something different? Like, you know, how did I have to for 27 years, you know, walk out these, these tenets of the faith with such earnestness. I was very earnest. I believed it with everything in me, but I was miserable in so many ways with my self-image and all of that. And so when I had to tear that all apart, it was like shocking. 
Yeah. I tried. In fact, I was afraid because I had a wrath fulfilled view of God that God was going to strike me down with a lightning bolt. He was going to, you know, destroy me mm. right there and there for not believing the Bible to be all true and, you know, all of that. Yeah. And I, so I find that part really interesting because I'm sure that I would say there, there are probably uh, sections of the charismatic movement that are very, very grace filled. You know, they're preaching a lot of grace and the fatherhood of God and love. And I'm sure that's what the, the, the gospel that you were preaching. Mm -hmm. How did you, uh, what's the question here? Maybe just an observation that you were still dealing with the fact that God is wrathful, even though you probably were preaching like the love and the grace of Christ. I was preaching, I was preaching the love and grace of Christ with a condition. There was always a condition. If you do this, then God will do this. And that is so not grace in my head, <laughs> mm. you know, or even the unconditional love of God, because there was a condition attached. And I was discipled very strongly in by an Old Testament believing man, really. Like, so I had going on the idea that, yes, God loves you. And I could preach a strong message on God's love but you have to accept God's love and you need to come to God in order for God to come to you. And there was always these conditions, not that just God loves everybody and all is well and swell. And, you know, it wasn't like that. What, what do you think? I'm assuming now that you still believe in God. I do. I do. What, what do you think changed the, you know, being feeling like you're betrayed by God to, to now where you still believe in him or it <laughs> <laughs> or she <laughs> or, I, I, I'm <laughs> here. I'm, I'm following this. Um, yeah. You know, I had to handle, I, I, I basically had to handle what had happened in my own life, what was genuine and what wasn't. And some of the most powerful things that happened in my life were so were real. They, they were not false. And I had to keep returning to that, how my mind was put back together, how I was rescued, how all these different things led up to certain things. That's what reconciled it for me was that, okay, God hasn't betrayed me altogether. Like that's where it started. Maybe there's some betrayal, but if we look at the big stuff over here, no, God, God hasn't betrayed me. But the true story was I had to wrestle through then all the things that weren't answered all the prayers that didn't work, all the times I um, was striving and working for, for God and feeling very alone in it and feeling very separated in it, feeling not loved by God. But then I would have this, but my mind was put back together and God did this cool thing over here. And so it was like this polarities back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And the way that I reconciled it, honestly, was I took the experiences and I just trumped those literally and said, mm. okay, those were impossibilities. God loves me. Mm. And that's what changed it. It was my own testimony, my own experience that caused me to continue to believe in God. I have a different view of God now, different names for God. Yeah. I, but yes. And that's what I actually, my next question mm -hmm. is, how do you feel like your, your beliefs have changed? Like what, who is God now? Well, God is not male or female. Okay. I just want to say what? that. No. I know. <laughs> I know. Like not in my, not like the version of the Bible, you know, God is not male or female, but I believe that God can, can, uh, you know, approach someone in that type of sensing of energy, maybe a masculine energy or a feminine energy um, for people. But I don't believe God is strictly male or God is strictly female. I just believe God is has no gender. Personally, this is what I believe. God is no gender and that God is energy. God is all that is around us right now. Everything lives and breathes and moves and has its being with God. So what, what do you make of the person of Jesus now? Jesus is interesting. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 for yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, Jesus isn't my savior. Okay. And that may shock some people who are listening, but I do, I no longer see Jesus as my savior of my sins 
or the one that will prevent me from going to hell because I no longer believe in a hell. And once I came to the understanding that hell was not actually being preached about like I was taught and I had the Bible all screwed up thanks to the rabbis who taught me, I then it, that sort of took away something that I had to sell now. Because see, the whole reason I was selling Jesus was because Jesus was going to keep people from hell. Yeah. Well, once hell became what it is, which is not, I just don't believe in hell anymore. Well, then what am I going to sell anymore? So then it's like, okay, what do I do with Jesus then? Because I did have an encounter of some sort with Jesus and I wasn't even religious yet. So, you know, like, what was that? Well, here's how I see Jesus. I see Jesus just as a higher dimensional being. You could say an ascended master, all of that, um, who came to earth, incarnated onto earth to teach us how to be divine and human at the same time. That Jesus to me now is a model, a teacher of what it is to walk divine and human together and that we all are like Jesus. I do not believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe his death was basically him saying, okay, you all want to put me on the cross because religion says that. So yes, I will do that, but I'm going to show you that religion can't hold me because I'm beyond religion. So it had nothing to do with sin in my head anymore. And Jesus is just a master. He's an ascended master. He's a guide. He comes and visits me and teaches me and talks to me and we hang out together. Um, we're friends. That's what Jesus said in the Bible that we're friends. I, I don't right. worship Jesus. Um, Jesus said in the Bible that um, as I am in the world, so are you. And so I began to see myself, wow, Jesus and I are on an even playing field. And this may shock a lot of people and it may people might be rolling their eyes right now. But all the messages that I see from Jesus in the Bible that were mistaught to me, and now I see totally differently, are all about unity and oneness and how we are the same. And so I, that's what I believe he is. He's just my, my guide. He's my teacher. So you guys like hang out for tea or what's that like? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus um, is very present in my life, actually. But I've let go of the religiosity of Jesus and what I was taught about Jesus. And Jesus is thankful I let go. I know that's going to shock some people. Uh, yeah. But I remember when I said, what's the deal, Jesus? Because, you know, I was taught to worship you. We sang songs about you, you know. I, and Jesus said, the reason I've gotten to the place, and this is just what I heard. The reason I've gotten to the place that I've gotten to is because people have elevated me. So much so that like I'm, I'm resonating everywhere, but that was never Jesus's desire is that people would put him up on these pedestals and all of these, like he's way up here. No, he, he just like me, hmm. sister and brother, best friends and have been for probably since I was a little girl. Wow. So I know on your website, you're talking about that you you had some kind of spiritual awakening. What is that? What does that mean to you? What did that look like? I think I've had more than one spiritual awakening. I think the one spiritual awakening that was most life changing was at 21 when I first met Jesus. That that was a big one. But then after that, I've had several awakenings. And these awakenings to me are me remembering who I am, coming back to self, coming back to me. Who am I? Who is Ellen? Because everything was always about who is God and God's way over here. And, you know, we're striving to be like God. And I never got to know me in the process at all. And I thought, well, am I anything? Like, what am I, chopped liver? Just like, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, is, is that what I am? Like, who am I? And I never discovered who I am. And so, a second spiritual awakening for me was a discovery of who I am. And that was the time when Jesus, my image of Jesus changed. And I realized Jesus and I were one and the same, human and divine, and learning to walk out that wonderful moment. And that to me was, was 
a powerful spiritual awakening, a remembering of who I am. Who am I? Mm. I am goodness. I am love. I am peace. I am all these things. I don't have to have Jesus to have those things. I am those things. I come from source. I come from light. I have all the ingredients of that. Jesus isn't the only one. I too have that. Mm. And that was my most, one of the most pivotal awakenings for me is knowing who I am because then self-love comes into play on that. Yes. I'm no longer at odds with myself. I was taught I was a sinner. Somewhere I missed the idea that I was created out of goodness. You know, that I am good. I am very good. And so when I started to realize, oh my God, I'm divine. Oh my, and I'm human, but I'm still divine. There's no separation. Oh my God, this is amazing. And it caused me to love me. And healing happened, real healing, real part of that spiritual awakening where we're just healing issues with regards to my self-image. Yeah, I would love to talk about that because I know that's a lot of how you, you know, work with people, I'm assuming. The healing yeah. is trauma. For you, how did you how did you go about that process? Oh gosh. Oh now there's a sweeping question. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, how did I go about that? Well, I did a variety of things. I um, did counseling. I went through counseling, um, sat in a, a long counseling room journey for a long time. And I'm going to use some Christian language here just so people understand where I'm going. But I had Christian counselors, but I also had people who the church would say is non-Christian. I don't think there's anything you know, about that label at all. But anyway, Christian and non-Christian counselors. So I sat in a lot of counseling rooms. I did meditations. I went on shamanic journeys, healing journeys, where I would go back into certain places within my womb. I'd go back into places within my mind. I'd have these full-on encounters where I am taken by my guides. Usually it was Jesus, um, but then I had angels as well, you know, who would help. And we would go back and we would look at this trauma and I would work through the anger and the bitterness, and I would, you know, have to deal with areas of forgiveness. Um, very full-on involved, involved process. But here's the thing. I didn't go hunt down memories to heal because I had so many broken memories. It would have taken like a bazillion years to do that. Instead, what ended up happening was the memories that Source would bring to the surface were root memories the memories that created more chaos in my life. So it would be the first incident when I went through sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. We'd look at that one because that was a breakage right there. Now, there were multiple incidences after that of sexual abuse, but that was your, that's irrelevant. It was the door opener one, the ones that were the root of all the rest of the chaos. And so we would look at all of those. We'd look at all of the generational ancestral lineage stuff that I had in my line that was just creating so much violence and creating so much unrest and creating my battles around mental health and all of those things. So we would, it was just deep dive after deep dive. Each session was about five or six hours in length. This went on for 14 years was a journey total wow. in healing for me. But the, but the real deals with uh, trauma related things was seven. I would say I'd put mm. it probably halfway. And it was just like every weekend I would go from Friday, Saturday into Sunday doing these healing sessions and they were powerful and they were incredible and they turned my life around. Um, I learned how to breathe. I did a lot of breathing exercises because I had a lot of panic breath because of the violence in my upbringing. And so I had short breath, I was, you know, or I would hold my breath and I wouldn't even realize. And so it was become conscious of the breath learning how to breathe. I would do breathing exercises with my counselors. I did um, areas of hypnosis, um, which mm -hmm. also is a, a wonderful tool um, to undo mindsets and limiting beliefs. I was sent to different places to um, talk about my problems. That's basically what it was all about. You talked it, you got it out because I had lost my voice so much so. And so I would just vent. And I would vent at these places. Sometimes I would go into the woods with my counselors. I would yell at trees. I would yell. Um, poor trees. Uh, yeah, I know the poor trees. <laughs> the trees are strong. I love trees. 
Um, the tree spirits were amazing. They grounded me every time. Um, sometimes I there's there's a connection between sound and healing. And so what I would do is I would take boxes and boxes and boxes of glass objects from Salvation Army. And I would go out into areas where there were dumps, you know, like in the woods, people dump things, you know, and they would have these dumps. And I would name the plate that I was, you know, I'd name it my brother, or I would name it an incident that happened. And I would throw it and I would hear the sound of it smashing, which then spoke to me smashing. And then I would see it splinter all over the place. And that to me was a visual representation of the trauma being destroyed. Mm. And I did that for one solid year. I bought so much boxes of glass from Salvation Army and I would just go out and I was just, cause I had, I had so much pent up stuff and I'm, I'm very much, I believe in holistic healing. I believe we need to see things. We need to smell things. We need to feel things. We need to hear things. And, and so, and we need to touch things. And so my entire healing was full on spirit, soul, body healing. That's why it took so long. Now, am I fully mm. healed? No. But am I going for wholeness in every area of my life? Yes, I am. Mm. I believe wholeness is our inheritance. Where do you feel like, because I know there's um, inner healing type of ministries in the charismatic movement. Oh, yes, I did them. And you did those. I did them. I'm, I'm curious, like, is, is there, do you find there's parallels? Is there something that you feel like is missing in that? So I did a program called Restoring the Foundations. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Um, it was started by um, Betsy and Chester Kilstraw, I think. Oh my goodness, I'm remembering. Betsy and Chester Kilstraw. And they were scientists and they came up with an idea during prayer, how to walk people through generational trauma. Like it was downloaded to them and it came to them. Um, and so that is a very reputable program because it talks about limiting beliefs. It talks about um, having, there's an experience you have in during it as well. You get to rewrite your own life. Um, there's forgiveness. There's, they deal with soul hurts. But where I think that Christian inner healing can get a little bit um, incomplete, uh, probably a lot incomplete, but, but where it gets incomplete is it views God from one perspective. Hmm. And for me, I think that's where we're limiting people is there are people all around the globe who either don't believe in God or they have all sorts of different viewpoints and beliefs of God. And so I believe that if some of these um, ministries would bring in other modalities, Eastern medicine, oh, no. different meditations, all of those things, you would have a more complete picture. So that's my view on it. I, I believe that it's incomplete. Got it. Got it. Um, bear with me one second. Um, you, you cut out for a moment and I'm just getting my bearings here. Um, how, how can we, cause I know you, you were a certified a spiritual coach, a healer. How can we start to awaken our own divinity? I think it's different for everybody. I know that there would be people that would say that we can awaken other people. Um, I don't believe that actually. So <laughs> um, I don't, I don't believe that um, I have the ability to awaken somebody. I believe that somebody needs to be ready for the awakening before they can be awakened. And what I mean by that is that they are, um, wanting to let go of the stories. See, it's, it's a process to awaken because there's a letting go of the attachments we have to everything on earth. These attachments to our stories, our labels, our beliefs, this and that. And so I think if somebody is ready, they will end up finding themselves in a deconstruction group 
on Facebook, or they find <laughs> themselves running across a book um, and they begin to read it or they begin to hear people's stories. I think listening is a beautiful tool to, to maybe help someone awaken, but I really believe that the awakening is so personal that someone could listen to the same deconstructive message over and over and over and over and over about deconstruction and never go anywhere with it. And then someone else over here can listen to the deconstruction message and awakening and totally dive in with everything in them. I believe that you have to, there's a readiness that comes with awakening. Personal belief, maybe people don't believe that. So to answer your question, to <laughs> awaken somebody, I think be willing to listen. Put yourself in positions and places and spaces where people have different beliefs instead of like hanging out with the club. Hmm. That's like what that. happened to me. I got I got out. I saw other religions. I saw other spiritualities in front of me. But again, that that in some ways, I was ready for that. I was seeking that already. I I I was a seeker of truth already, and so truth right. will find you. It just will. It's beautiful. Now I have a super hard question. I mean, just just getting your opinion. I, I don't My, know. <laughs> I don't know if I'm answering so, anything. <laughs> So if we're not meant to, you know, be here to glorify Jesus and to, uh, you know, usher in the, the church and whatnot, uh, what is the purpose of us being here? Why are we here? For us. Hmm? To know us. To know us. What else is there to know? Because when we discover us, then we discover everything that is around us as well. We discover the supernatural as we discover us. As we realize that we can, that there's a, a other dimensions, there's other levels of consciousness. As we begin to unpack that, what else is there? It's a beautiful discovery. Hmm. I believe we're here to remember where we came from. Where did we come from? We came from source, we came from light. We came from something up there that is really wonderful and has our best interests at heart. Isn't it all like religion taught? I think we're we're here to remember that. We're not here to remember where Jesus came from. We're, we're no, we're, we're not here to put an agenda forth. We're here to remember us, to remember our goodness, our innate goodness our awesomeness. Everyone's awesome. Everyone has goodness in them, regardless of what it can even look like, because we are created from goodness. And I think it's a remembrance of that, a remember of creation. Remember that the tree that I'm looking at outside out there right now, we are connected, knowing that, knowing that I am here as a, as a creator because I come from creation. That's powerful to know that we are loved, to know that you, Justin, are special, to know that what you bring to the planet, no one else can bring, to know that your light is so unique and so utterly yours. That's what you're remembering. You're remembering the uniqueness of who you are in the whole landscape of the cosmos as divine and as human. That's what Jesus did when he came here, when he came, was he grew in his understanding of God and he grew in his understanding of man. As do he we. He began to understand his purpose. I think too, to, to take it another step further, I think that when you start to know who you are and all the wonderful ingredients inside of you that you've been given in your awesome DNA, then there's a sense of purpose that can actually come. I don't mean an agenda. I don't mean something that's selfish or like I'm full on all about, you know, my ego there. Not that. I think there's a humility that comes with that. And you're like, whoa, I'm incredible. Whoa. And I think it's ultimately a slap in God's face to not like who you are. 
to not think that you're awesome, to know that you are enough. God's like, yes, awesome, Justin. You know that you're enough. Hmm. You're amazing. Yes, Justin, that's how I feel. Yes, it's it's like that clarion call, I think, to all of us to remember our goodness, to remember who we are, where we came from, how we can create and you know we can destroy as equally as we can create on the planet and to create this new earth to bring in the restoration of all things. We can we can do that. We're here to restore, we're here to heal. We're here to help bring each other home on the restoration path. I'm here to take your hand today and say, "Come on. Let's go on the path of love. Let's let's take a walk. Let's remember who we are." Mm. That's what I believe we're here for. And do you feel like we are, say we, I guess like humanity is on the verge of a spiritual awakening of sorts? I think we're all in awakening right now. I remember when I used to practice Christianity and it was very much like revival, right? You know, oh, the revival, you know, we're waiting for revival. Yep. Why, you know, when you look back on it now, I'm like, I'm glad we don't want revival. I don't want to revive what's dead. I want to awaken into something. I want to see people awaken. And I just believe by the very reason we are here on planet earth, everybody who's present right now, all 7.5 billion people are here and are awakening already. They may not know it yet. It may not become conscious. It might not be in their conscious mind right now. I'm awakening. I know it. No, but everybody is on the path to awakening. That's, that's just our journey here. That's the earth school to awaken from our slumber. Awake, awake, oh sleeper. You know, mm -hmm. like that's, mm -hmm. that, that's what's happening. We are awakening from our slumber, everyone. Okay. Forgive me for this question. It's a I really tough question. <laughs> <laughs> I just like, yeah, it's good. So, and I, I'm like a very analytical guy, but it's, it's getting better. Um, in your opinion, um, I don't know. I'm sure you have thought about it a lot because you've been on the front lines of where people are deeply, deeply suffering and where there is massive evil. Um, how do we, how do we reconcile or how do you maybe understand why there's evil and suffering in the world? Well, now there's a doozy. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> how do I reconcile? I don't think I have reconciled everything. Um, I would be foolish to say that I reconciled it all because I haven't, I, I still see horrible things happen, but I think for me, what has helped me anyway, it hasn't certainly perfected that inquiry at all, mm -hmm. but I think what has helped me is I, I don't blame God for it. Okay. God, God's not that. I believe that we have to take responsibility for the stuff that's happening here. And that, that's strong. Now, someone may say to me, well, I don't have to take responsibility for you know the starving children in Africa. Well, I don't know about that. Because once you realize who you are, once you realize you're here with all this goodness and here to help restore and heal, you're going to want to do something with that. I mean, if you're not, if you're, if, if you're, if you see starving children and you're not moved at all, and it's just like, oh yeah, look at the poor starving kid over there. <laughs> well, I have a problem. Okay. Then yeah. I'm like, all right, there's something wrong. So I don't blame God. I believe that there are some things I will not know. Probably this, this side of my time here on the earth. And I'll know more when I, you know, pass on and go into other spaces and places. But I believe that we play a role in that with what is happening here on the planet. I believe how we have, how I treat my neighbor is really important to me. Even if I dislike my neighbor 110%, I don't want that bad energetic exchange. I, I don't wanna keep that going, but that comes by knowing who you are. You don't wanna do that. Hmm. Well, right. I, sorry, just want, so yeah, go ahead. Me, to wrap up that question, First off, I don't think I have totally figured it out. And two, um, hurt people hurt people. And there's a, a level of responsibility with us to change this direction of how we're going on the planet. 
There's not going to be a white savior that's going to come in and save the day. Okay, there just isn't. Sorry, I hate to Thanks tell for you. Thanks for ruining it. I love <laughs> that. Thing. <laughs> no, because that takes away our responsibility to reconcile. Takes away, it takes away our responsibility. Like if if, if you know something's going to come in on some white cloud and save the day, well, then I don't need to give a shit about the kids in Africa. I don't need to give a shit about people in trafficking then, because you know eventually it's all just going to work itself out. And I think that's a cop out. Hmm. I think we 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 sort what we can inside ourselves regarding evil as best we can and try to understand why it's here and how it grows us. I think it's a different way of reframing evil. We grow through terrible tragedies and bad things. But then I think we have to flip it on its head and begin to restore. So what what is your hope and, and, and vision for the world? My hope and vision for the world. Well, I don't think we're all going to be sitting on a nice cloud singing Kumbaya. Okay. Like I, I don't, I, I don't. Well, what if I like Kumbaya? Oh, okay. Well, all right. I'll sit with you around the campfire and you can play the guitar and do Kumbaya. But um, my hope is for the restoration of the planet where we are connected with mother earth and nature and we are returning back to our very roots of who we are because then when we do that hope will be on the planet restoration and healing and peace will be on the planet when we return to who we really are mm. because then the natural outflow on the earth which would be my desire is a, a beautiful, um, this is a Christian term, but like a, a Greek, Greek term actually, koinonia, like where we just, we are, we are hand in hand, we're heart in heart. I'm one with you, you're one with me. We're not separated. There's a unity and a connection and all of that. That's what my hope is for the world is that we, we come into unity and connection with each other with mother earth and um, also knowing that we've never been separated from God. So we've always been in union with God. Um, if, if people want to find you and, and work with you, how can they do that? Um, they can go to ascendinghope.net and that is my website for my coaching business. Awesome. Any then, last words? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I like you, Justin. Oh, <laughs> so, great. I like, I like <laughs> Thank you, you a lot. Um, I would say just keep going. It's a rough time. The planet's going through all this type of change and upheaval, but it's good. We we're, we're returning back to who we are. We're, we're coming into that place. And, and I would encourage people that if you're starting to doubt right now, like if you're already like, I already feel this stuff sitting in church and I don't know where to go you know, begin to check in with myself or other people online, um, you know, that are talking about awakening and talking about, you know, the deconstruction process. I encourage people to not just like push it down and say, I don't feel that way. If you're questioning Jesus or you're questioning his death and you're questioning all these other things, allow yourself to question, allow yourself to detach. You have permission. This is my big spiel right now on Instagram is you have permission to question everything that you've been taught. So please do it. Yeah. I love that permission. I wouldn't thank you so much for just sharing your heart and um, thank you for the work that you do. Thank you, Justin, for bringing me on. Okay. Thanks guys for watching. Um, I have the links below with Ellen, so you should be able to contact her and uh, we'll see you next time. Okay. So.